what you gonna do, the hot dollar, or crypto bull guy, and his crypto maniacs, and the entire cryptocurrency market run wild on you! Welcome in. I am the Crypto Bull God. And in today's video, the family. This video is dedicated to my family who is in the market. And this family will be the cream of the crop. And we will be rising to the absolute top. <laughs> Welcome in. I am the Crypto Bull God. And this is the recorded on Tuesday, airing on Tuesday, eh, potentially Wednesday. August 10th, 2021 Crypto Bull God Podcast. You can find me on Twitter, TradingView, YouTube, and yes, now Instagram for some motivational workout videos. At Crypto Bull God. How's everybody doing? How's everybody feeling today? If it's Tuesday, how's your day been going for you? If it's Wednesday morning, chances are this is released very early around 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so you're probably not even awake if you're listening to this first thing in the morning. But either way, how you doing? Things are good here. It's sunny in South Florida. It's hot as hell. Um, but as I'm looking out the window here, it makes me wish that I had a... makes me wish I either had a house with a nice porch, like a, obviously a covered porch I could sit out on evenings like this. Maybe I might, yeah, might be conducive to... Smoking a cigar more frequently. I could see myself smoking a cigar once a month. Um, I sit out there with maybe a, a glass of whiskey some evenings and just chill, relax. You know, a peaceful backyard. Either that or be nice to go out on a porch uh, beachfront. You know, I've always had a desire to have a condo beachside. That would be very, very nice right about now. But either way, I hope you're doing well. Shit is good here because the uh, markets have certainly turned around and um they are heading tremendously higher which is a message that um a message a message that i've consistently been communicating for a while now speaking of the markets and speaking of charting uh i've been saying on twitter now for a while you know i've been advertising this thing called chart mania it's going to be a live streaming event um, where i will chart anything that has the capability of being charted cryptocurrency wise uh in trading view and I'll do a detailed analysis, you know, based on the live chat, what, whatever you guys would like me to chart. I'll pull it up, do a detailed analysis, give you my thoughts and opinions on it. Just based on the TA, this is not about fundamentals. I'm not doing a fundamental live stream, hence why it's called Chart Mania. Um, but just, just based on the technicals. Um, but I need to hit 1,000 subscribers, and right now my YouTube channel is only at like 962 or 963, so I still need a few more people. Hopefully you can help me out by subscribing to the channel if you're not, sharing it with other people, um, liking the video, leaving a comment, you know, liking the podcast, leaving a comment. You know, when you do these things, when you like any of the videos or drop a comment or do anything like that, it helps to better circulate this circulate. Um, this material so it reaches a wider audience. So please, if you appreciate the content, I, I really appreciate it. It doesn't take much of an effort. By the way, speaking of um, content and speaking of new content, if you recall, if you've been here since the very start, I can't believe this is, I'm 16 podcast episodes in. Um, so for those who have been here for a while, thank you. Sometimes I question why, <laughs> why, why you tune in, but I do appreciate it. Um, the thing that I mentioned on episode one, uh, CBG podcast, episode one, was that the real podcast that I was looking forward to doing was the one with my brother. And while I'm not ready to make, we are not ready to make an official announcement in terms of when that podcast is starting up, we are getting very, very close, and I'm very excited about that. So my brother and I already have um, a tentative agenda for episode one. It's going to definitely be a different feel from this podcast. Uh, my brother will be much more, <laughs> my brother will be a lot better and much more organized at collecting thoughts in terms of how we could structure the podcast. I kind of wing it. Um, so I think he'll be a big help in that aspect. Um, but I think, you know, my brother and I have a very good relationship. And so I think you'll see, you'll feel that come through on the podcast that we have really good rapport 
Um, so I'm really looking forward to doing that with him. So stay tuned. Follow me on Twitter. There'll certainly be an announcement at some point. I have a piece of lettuce stuck in my... I hate when that happens. You know, you get a piece of lettuce, like, stuck in the back of your mouth. Anyway, um, one of the things that I wanted to quick touch on related to Bitcoin... Well, I'm not going to quick touch on something with Bitcoin. I actually want to talk about a few things with Bitcoin in the cryptocurrency markets, um, since hopefully that's the reason mostly that you're tuning in. You know, the most recent TA video that I did where I, I focused on Bitcoin, while in general, I'm proud of the content that I put out there because it's very authentic and re is representative of who I am. And I'm, you know, genuinely help, aiming to help people and entertain them at the same time. I don't have as much time right now to go through and, and um, put as much thought into some of the videos, spend as much time editing the videos. And so, a lot of the material I put out, it's not as good as it could otherwise be. If I had more time, I do see that changing at some point. I'd also be putting out more material. But the reason I bring this up is because in that latest Bitcoin video that I did two TA videos ago, really what I was trying to explain in that video, and I'm not sure how good of a job I did, was that one of the things we can do to provide us with a leading indicator that there's going to be a bullish trend reversal um, within price action on Bitcoin, since we've had some bearish price action, is we can zoom in on the smaller time frames to see what's taking place. Because as bullish structure builds on smaller time frames and it continues to consolidate at higher levels and remain bullish, Eventually, what happens is it bleeds over into larger time frames. And once it bleeds over into those larger time frames, it then bleeds into even larger time frames, right? So if I look at the Bitcoin price action right now, what I've been pointing out on Twitter is we saw a golden cross, you know, where, and again, I've shared this many times. The golden cross is where the 50 simple moving average moves above the 200 simple moving average. Golden crosses don't need to be on any specific time frame. It's just the action of the 50 curling above the 200, and then you also already have like the 10 and 20 above uh, those lines as well. Everything's in descending order. Um, so you can have a golden cross on a daily time frame, a weekly time frame. You can have a daily cross on a five-minute time frame. But the point is, you know, on the four-hour, we saw a golden cross. Bitcoin continued to consolidate higher, creating higher highs and higher lows. We then saw it bleed over into the six hour. And now I'm clicking on the eight hour. And then I go to the 10 hour. We have a golden cross. And the chart, if you've been here for a long time, I've preached the significant importance. And it looks like, which is the 12 hour, we are about to get a golden cross on the 12 hour chart, which is very significant, in my opinion, if you historically go back and you look at the charts of Bitcoin, the times price has seen candle body closes below the 200 simple moving average on a 12 hour chart, it's very bearish. Okay. And you can see back in early May, once we started getting candle body closes below there, that's when we saw our significant dip in price. Now, Price action, candle body close-wise, on the 12-hour chart, we've had several candle bodies close above the 200 simple moving average. And what has happened is, because price action continues building these stair steps of higher highs and higher lows, the moving averages are moving up as a result, and now we look like we're going to hit a golden cross on the 12-hour by tomorrow. So, well, depends what day you're listening to this, right? So, uh, I'm recording this on Tuesday. So, we should see a golden cross on the 12 on the 12 hour chart uh, by Wednesday, August 11th. Now, a couple things there. Um, first off, just because we're getting a golden cross on any time frame, it could be anything, any other time frame. It could be a 12 hour, one day, one week. It doesn't mean prices are going to explode right away. Okay, that's that's not what we're saying here. What we're saying is. Um, these are signs within a chart to indicate to us that there has been a trend reversal, momentum in the market to the upside, and we can expect um, further upside to continue. It doesn't mean there won't be corrections. It doesn't mean that price won't have a negative day. It doesn't mean things are moving up in a straight line. It just means that the bullish structure that we've been beginning to build within the price will continue moving forward unless negated uh, 
based on bearish price action, which would be uh, lower highs and lower lows, okay? But the other thing that's important to keep in mind and char a chart that every uh, technician will be looking at is the one day, okay? People really focus on the one day chart. And so after we get this golden cross tomorrow on the 12 hour chart, the next chart to keep an eye on is the one day. And it looks like right now, both the 50 and 20 simple moving average, key moving averages are both curling up. The 200 simple moving average has flattened up. It actually looks like there's a small rate of increase in it. So I would expect a golden, you know, given that the bullish price momentum continues within this market, which I fully expect, if you've been paying any attention to things I've tweeted uh, and my YouTube content, you know that is exactly my educated opinion. So as long as price continues moving up, creating higher highs and higher lows, I fully expect that we'll see a golden cross on the daily maybe at some point. I mean, I'm just guesstimating at this point. Could be as early as late August. Uh, very end of August, very beginning of September. Depends how bullish uh, price action gets. You know, something else I wanted to speak to um, that I can elaborate on is, you know, in technical analysis, one of the most fundamental things we talk about are creating higher highs and higher lows within the price, which are stair steps. And it's um, signs of a, tr a bullish trend reversal. It's signs of uh, even in just a bull market, it's a sign of continuation of a bullish trend. And so let's relate this to a moving average, okay? Ask yourself this question. What is a simple moving average, okay? For example, what is a 50 simple moving average, okay? There's no magic to it. The 50 simple moving average is literally looking at the closing. Let's, let's look at the daily um, time frame as an example. It's looking at the candle body closes for the past 50 days, dividing that, all, summing all that up and dividing by 50, uh, and you get an average price, okay? So what happens is as we continue forward, as, it's, uh, as we turn the dial to tomorrow, for instance, the oldest day, okay, the first day within that moving average, the oldest day falls off, and the newest day goes on that average, and you just sum up the prices and take an average price to get the moving average for the next day, right? So it would make sense that when we had our death cross back in June, and we talk about the fact that the 50 is under the 200 SMA, okay? That is what the death cross is. What we want to see is we want to see the 50 curl back above the 200 SMA, right? Well, what's going to have that occur? Well, the more recent price action, if it begins to build that bullish structure, okay, of higher highs and higher lows, as we move forward in time, the older dates, the older price action, right, where we saw capitulation and lower highs and lower lows, those price candles, they begin to fall off within the calculation of a moving average. And the more recent price action, which is higher than that older data, you know, the higher highs and higher lows, that is computed or calculated within the simple moving average. That's why the moving average begins to move up in time as we gain the higher highs and higher lows in price action. I'm hoping that that makes sense. So it all fits together. We create higher highs and higher lows in the price action, and that also, in turn, will result to the moving averages increasing in value over time. I'm hoping that I'm explaining this really well and you're able to follow me. I don't think that's something that I need to visually show you if you listen to the word choices I'm using. And, you, you know, if you're not, uh, I can appreciate this. You know, I'm one of these people who, um, even though I'm very good with mathematics, I can compute things in my head. Again, you know, I always default to the, I'm an actuary, so I, you know, I have to be mathematically inclined to be, to be an actuary. But if you looked at me reading something, that doesn't mean I'm a fast reader or can read through things lightning fast. Oftentimes when I read, I read out loud to myself. I like reading out loud. It helps me to retain things. I oftentimes also, not only do I read slow and I'll read out loud, sometimes I'll read something a second time. Um, so the reason I bring this up is don't feel ashamed or don't feel silly if you have to go back and re-listen to that segment to really see if you understand what it is that I explained um, 
related to the correlation, the positive correlation that exists between moving averages increasing in value relative to higher highs and higher lows in candle bodies, okay? But something I want to really hit home on and, you know, something you're going to find within the content that I produce on, um, sandals falling off here, something you're going to find, uh, uh, within the content that I produce on Twitter and YouTube is there is a lot of consistent messaging that I like to put out surrounding uh, concepts, uh, thought processes surrounding various things within the cryptocurrency um, market because I feel it's important to drill certain things in your head, okay? Things that are very important, things you can benefit from, you're going to um, get repetition from me in those areas. So this is something I really wanna drive home with you. The turnaround that's taking place in this market, okay, I'm on record as saying this, this will happen quick. It is happening quick. On July 20th, or excuse me, on July, yeah, on July 20th, Bitcoin's price was around $29,000, okay, $30,000. Since that time, what, three weeks later, you know, we're up, we've, this is, by the way, we're in the midst right now of having our second daily candle close above the 200 simple moving average. That is so motherfucking bullish. Okay, we want to continue to see candle bodies and candle body closes above the 200 SMA or right around that line. Okay, we can dip a little below. It's all right, but we don't want to see massive corrections below that 200 SMA right now, which is sitting at $45,000. We really want to try to stay in that 42 to $45,000 area and continue to allow those higher highs to feed into the moving averages. Most recent price calculation, we push out the older bad data that was low and they begin to curl up and we get that golden cross within the next couple weeks. That, that's what we want, all right? But what I really want to stress here is that this turnaround has been quick. I mean, how many assets can you invest in that in three weeks will have over a 50% gain in value? Now, it's impossible to call the exact bottom or call the exact top. However, you study these markets long enough, you do TA long enough, and the educated opinions that you form about the market have more credence, have more credibility. You can feel more confident about it, right? I've been on record for the past three months saying 30,000 was the bottom. Was 30,000 the bottom? Hell yeah, it was the bottom. We might have wicked down to 28.6, 28,600. But the, the point is, is I felt very convicted that that zone right around $30,000 was our bottom. We weren't going to 20,000. We weren't going to 15,000. Those, those calls to me, while they were a uh, probability, there are no certainties with anything. Again, something I want to stress, no certainties with anything. But the probabilities were in our favor for the price to remain right around $30,000. I kept stressing it over and over and over and over and over again. You know, I had the salty people coming at me. You know, wake off. The wake off pattern's playing out. You know, and that was the other irritating thing. You had all these people on YouTube with their... Their fancy uh, cover photos on their YouTube videos, hyping things up and and uh, drawing you know drawing you in based on your emotional uh, heartstrings, just just tugging at those emotional heartstrings of fear, right? To bring you in, just like during Euphoria, the same thing's gonna happen, right? One of the ways I've thought a lot about this. One of the ways that I feel I will be most successful within this space is no matter how large my YouTube or Twitter following grows. Right now, I have almost 1,000 followers or subscribers on YouTube. Let's say someday I get to 10,000, 100,000. You know, I grow massively in volume. Success to me, okay, a very large part of success to me is remaining true to who I am. I'm very authentic. I'm very genuine. If you can see, <laughs> if you can see past the entertainment value of my character, Again, just looking to try to put smiles on, on people's faces and make them laugh. That's all it is. But if you can appreciate the humor and see past it, then I'm actually providing you with very sound, logical information. Um, the other thing you should be feeling from me is I'm very authentic, genuine, and highly educated. And I never want those things to change, no matter how large my following grows. That is very, very critical to me. Integrity. Integrity is at the core 
of just who I am as a person in everything that I do. And so that's something that I always want you to be, I want you to always be able to rely on me for. But getting back to this turnaround, it's going to continue to occur quickly. And one of the things that I've, I've stressed over and over again is that when we enter a true euphoric stage, when Bitcoin is approaching $100,000 and then cuts through $100,000 like a hot knife through butter, you have to have a plan for when you want to sell portions of your Bitcoin and altcoin investments. You know, logical scale-out approaches. Because this is my opinion. Again, everything I share with you is my opinion. I do not think it's very prudent for you to listen to the people who say Bitcoin is going to $500,000. I Just like I do not did not think it was prudent for you to listen to people saying Bitcoin was going to $20,000 or below. But I don't think it's prudent for you to listen to the people who are saying, we're, you know, Bitcoin is going to $500,000, okay, some astronomical price. I don't think it's prudent for you to listen to people to, to, that say we're not going to have a historic, uh, a similar historic correction within all of crypto and Bitcoin. All we can do is make inferences on what may occur in the future based on past data, right? Every past cycle has resulted in a monumental correction within the cryptocurrency cycle. And until something happens differently, you better believe that I believe the entire crypto space, all coins will correct, you know, they'll do their 95 to 99% corrections just like they always have until proven otherwise. Again, I'm not allowing my emotions and my fundamental bias to play into this. I'm just looking at data and approaching it logically, okay? Until proven otherwise, Bitcoin's going to have a similar correction to me, okay? Bitcoin has corrected, I believe, off. this is off the top of my head, okay? So cut me some slack. Bitcoin in the prior two cycles has corrected somewhere around 85% each time. They were slightly different, but around 85%. Maybe this time the correction given the increase in market cap size... Maybe it's closer to 80% or 77% or 78%. But I firmly, 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 firmly believe that we're going to see a similar correction in Bitcoin. Okay? And if, you, if, you ha if you're beginning to get doubts that we're going to see something like that because of things you're reading from some people in this space... I remember back in 2020 that because it was the rationale was because in institutional investors are involved in Bitcoin, we would never see a massive um, bull cycle correction like we've seen in the past. You know, we historically in prior bull cycles have seen, you know, 35, 40 percent corrections in Bitcoin. People were saying, oh, this is never going to happen. Let's do some quick math. OK, now I did not agree with that. I argued with people on Twitter about this, but you can only argue so much and then you just. You know, you ignore people at some point and let them think what they're going to think. Um, so Bitcoin went up to 65, about $65,000. And we corrected to, we had a sharp wick to 28,600. So 28,600 divided by 65,000. That represents 44% of the price. I'm not good with math. I'm an actuary. So look at that. A 56% correction. Now I want you to think about this. Just exercise you don't have to be mathematically inclined. I just want you to exercise common sense and logic, okay? As stated before, and which is increasingly being proven as price continues to move up, and it looks like it really was a capitulation event within a massive bull market. If in a massive bull market, bull cycle, four-year journey we've been on, we have bearish price action within, think about it, Think of the universe. Oh, no. Think of planet Earth. Think of planet Earth. I'm very, I'm very visual in terms of learning, so maybe this will help some of you visual learners. Think of planet Earth as the four-year cycle, the four-year bullish cycle that we're in. And think of the bearish price action as a continent within the United States. Uh, within, or excuse me, continent within the United States. Cripes. What am I saying? A 
continent with the United States. Jesus. I'm not going to edit that out. Let's leave that shit in there. Think of a continent. Whoop, voice change. Uh, think of a continent uh, within planet Earth, okay? That continent represents um, a massive uh, bearish correction that took place all encapsulated within the... Uh, and it's a small continent too, I gotta say that. A small continent in the entire planet Earth, okay? Well, if... <clears throat> If a small continent or moderate-sized continent, maybe I should throw this visual depiction out the window because the more I keep saying this, it sounds silly. But the point is, is in a massive bullish cycle, if you're getting bearish price action that results in a 56% correction, what do you think is actually going to happen if we enter a true bear cycle, just like we have the prior two times? Do you really think if we enter another massive bear cycle, okay, and I do say if because it's not a certainty, it's a probability that is more likely than not based on historical data, okay, data analyst here, I'm a data analyst, um, don't you think that price in Bitcoin would correct much greater than 56%? Look, my last TA video, we looked at Stellar Lumens correcting 76%. Don't you think it's going to correct by more than 76% in a true bear market? And I talked about the fact that for all coins in a, in a bull cycle, we talked about Ethereum, it was very common in prior cycles to see all coins correct around 70% or more uh, and see bearish price action like that in a massive bull cycle. You know, Ethereum did it in July of 2017. Okay, it then went on a massive run and hit 1420. Um, so it's just, I think, important to reaffirm certain key things to yourself at this point because... If you've, you know, if it's especially for the people who've been here for a while and have a good sense of things, look, guys, we've been here for a long time. We've waited for this moment. It's impossible for me to put into words to you right now how excited I am for this moment. When I live stream, you know, when I reach personal goals of mine and I do a live stream, you'll you'll see the excitement. But I can't even begin to fathom how excited I will be. And, you know, it's natural to be excited at the thought of reaching certain goals in your life, but it's very, very important to remain unemotional in the sense of how you're going to, going to approach your investment philosophy, okay? I'll give you an example. Um, I am a very firm believer in... Hedera Hashgraph's technology and their token HBAR, okay? A lot of real-world use cases, strong fundamentals, a real uh, case for being not only in the top 20, but in the top 10 cryptocurrency projects. I believe that very much. However, that doesn't mean just based on the fundamentals and I, that I'm going to get emotionally attached to my investment if I understand that HBAR, once it has its blow off top in the three, four, five, ten dollar range, somewhere in there, anywhere in there, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to exercise logic, remain unemotional, and scale out at reasonable levels because I personally believed, based on the empirical data, that HBAR will see a 95 to 99% correction during a bear cycle, okay? You really need to get a handle, if you haven't, you need to get a handle on your emotions and you need to get a handle on the market to understand how you're logically gonna scale out. If your plan is to just sell the absolute top, you're going to lose out. If your plan is to believe we're in some super mega cycle and Bitcoin's going to $500,000, you're going to lose out. You have to exercise logic and be very rational, rationable and reasonable about things. Now, rationable, what was it? rational? Is the word rational, CBG? Speaking of being rational, um, many shifts been very irrational. Let's quick, uh, let's quick touch on an evening out with mini shift and a, a couple other people uh, this past Friday. So I went out on Friday night, and it was Mini Schiff and um, two other friends, one of whom I just met. Real funny guy, you know. 
one of the guys that came out. Um, that's one ability I don't have, which I really, I really admire people who are just naturally funny. Like my brother is a great example. Like my brother, my brother is a very good storyteller. Like in particular, I mean he's a funny person in general, but he's a real good storyteller. I am not a good storyteller, and I'm not naturally uh, very funny. You, you know. Uh, I have my moments. I got my moments, but I'm not naturally comical or naturally funny. But the, one of the dudes that came out on Friday, he he, <laughs> he had a real real funny sense of humor, which I'll get to in a moment. But first, um, drove over to a place, which, by the way, one of the things I want to comment on South Florida real quick, if you've ever been here, driving on 95 is the motherfucking worst. 95 South or North? Dear Lord. Say a prayer to whoever, you know, God, uh, uh, Buddha, whoever you pray to, say a prayer before you drive on 95 North or South, because it's like, it is like land of the wild, wild west on that road. People flying in and out of lanes, like a five-lane highway where it's always under construction and there's bumps in the roads, holes. Your car might literally go through the middle of a road. You don't know it. You know, there's... I've been driving at 70 miles an hour on 95 before and had a car with its four-way signals on stopped in the middle of a highway. I mean, you want to talk about near-death experiences. And then people are flying in and out of lanes with no turn signals. Hey, Mom, hope you decided to not listen to today's podcast because chances are you're having a panic attack right now. Uh, My mom's a little... She worries about everything. Anyway, so... Uh, on a more positive note, went out on Friday, so Mini Shift was there. Haven't seen him in a little bit. A couple other guys. And I always like to preface this just to be, you know, uh, I go overly uh, over the top here because, you know, my friendship with Mini Shift is very important to me. So I never want anything to be misconstrued, misconstrued or misinterpreted because he's, he's a great guy. And just because we have a disagreement on Bitcoin, you know, at the end of the day, doesn't mean shit, you know, because I respect his opinions. So I just want to clarify that very much. But anyway, now that I got that out of the way, (laughs) he just remains to be very, he continues to be very ignorant to, um, to Bitcoin. So, you know, even despite the data, he's a data analyst, just like myself. And, you know, the, the, the data shows that if you just hedge your portfolio by actually investing. If we just focus on Bitcoin for the moment, because people who get into the cryptocurrency space to just start out, to me, it intuitively makes sense um, that you should really focus on the biggest players, right? Because they have a um, they have a greater percentage of the pot pie. They overall have the greatest stability. Uh, and they're the pr- at the moment, they're the proven market winners. And so I think it makes sense to kind of focus on those projects. So, you know, even if you took your money and you invested, uh, you know, all in Bitcoin or 50-50 into Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? Numbers show, if we just talk about Bitcoin for a second, that if you hedge part of your portfolio, what, we're talking about small amounts here, 1% to 3%, you put in a big Bitcoin, it actually hedges your portfolio against market volatility and it results historically in a better performing portfolio. You know, me suggesting to Minishift to just put 3% of his investment portfolio into Bitcoin to him seems mind-boggling. It's too, it's too risky. Um, and it just blows my mind because somebody with a surface-level understanding of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, yes, I said surface level of understanding, Minishift, um, when you compare that level of understanding to someone like myself who has just engrossed himself for years and years now, Um, and I've just spent too many countless hours studying fundamentals and technicals. Um, yes, this space is risky, but if you're well-versed and well-educated in the area and you can make educated decisions, you cut down that risk level and increase the likelihood that you'll see greater, um, investment portfolio performance. Okay. And I am, I have proven that. Okay. Um, so you know, it's sometimes it's frustrating conversating with him about it because he's so stubborn about things. But um, but it, it really is what it is as much as I hate that expression. The funny, the funny, oh, by the way, he did capitulate, by the way. He does own Bitcoin per my tweet. So he has capitulated and has a small amount of Bitcoin. Um, 
Of course, he said he's doing that to hedge his bet against me, which is the double or nothing now. Since Bitcoin hit 50000 this year, he lost. He owes me an evening out. We doubled or nothing the bet. And I said, all right, fine. Let's do uh, $100,000 before the end of the year. And, you know, it's double or nothing. So, I mean, he's obviously going to lose that. So it's now going to either be an extremely expensive night out, uh, in which case I will have my girl in town. And we'll all go out, and then we'll have one big night. Or um, I'll go out and have uh, two two uh, smaller evenings, you know, out, double or nothing. So uh, uh, thank you in advance, Mini Shift, for being so generous. Can't wait to go out uh, to that Mexican place that I mentioned. But the, the funny part of the evening was the other two guys that were there, I haven't really had any extensive conversations with him about cryptocurrency. And if you... You egg me on and you bring up the topic. I tried to actually let it go. A couple, There were a couple distinct points during the conversations. I was trying to just let the conversation go out of cryptocurrencies because I know how I can get. I'm so passionate about this space. But this one dude who had an awesome sense of humor, he would say something just to kind of continue the conversation. And at one point I was going on and on and on. And, and I said this explicitly. I said, yeah, I was like, I'm going on and on. And maybe it was a little bit of the, the third spicy margarita talking. But I said, yeah, 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 I mean, even if you don't have 1% to 3% of your portfolio invested in Bitcoin or crypto, it's irresponsible. And it's just ignorant. And so, you know, because it's the passion coming out. I can't help it. So that's a little dickish thing to say, right? So, I mean, it was a little dickish of me to say. Uh, I'm not going to disagree with that. But I was very passionate and, and, and trying to convey um, at the level of intelligence that I have, education that I have about this market, how insane it seems for me uh, for people not to be, have a small risk exposure to the market. That's what I was trying to convey. And so, you know, I, a couple points during the evening, he looked at me and said, I just, you know, I just, what I got out of this conversation, I just can't wait to go home and tell my wife even though you know we have a few boats you know we we don't have any debt um we're gonna retire early i mean i just can't wait to tell her that apparently all this time we've been ignorant and irresponsible with our finances and it was just you know how, you know how the way somebody delivers a joke it's all about the delivery like you you and i both could say something at the right time for it to be funny but the person who says it in the right tone, in the right way, it's funny. And the other person who doesn't, it's not as funny. It was just the way he delivered it, right? It was just the way he said it. Uh, it was pretty entertaining. But we had a good time. We had a good time. Friday was a really nice time. Speaking of a nice time, real quick, uh, before we get into the last few segments here, um, on cryptocurrency and Twitter questions, also had a last uh, real nice time to, yes, Two Saturdays ago, or no, 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 two Sundays ago. So, uh, two things. One, I know some guys complain about going to brunch with their girl because, you know, uh, now I will say it does become an issue if it's during football season. NFL starting up soon. So, I am a Philadelphia Eagles fan. If those who have been paying attention closely know, and so eh, brunch could become an, an issue during uh, NFL season, but. You know, I know the girls, they like to get dressed up in these Sunday dresses and do all, you know, blah, blah, blah. But brunch can be an awesome, awesome experience. The thing you have to make sure you do when you go to brunch is you have to go somewhere where they have bottomless mimosas. If they don't have bottomless mimosas or at least something close to it, you know, where it's a relatively fair price per bottle of champagne— um, you're not going to the right place, right? You're not going to brunch to have a bowl of oatmeal uh, and a side of eggs unless you're going out to eat with your parents or your family. If you're going out with your girl, if you're going out with, in a group, you're going to have some mimosas. You're going to have a lot of mimosas, right? Or Bloody Marys. If you like Bloody Marys, I'm not a Bloody Mary guy, but, you know. Um, so I was very proud of who I was with because the first time we went out to brunch, we went through two bottles of champagne. This prior time we went out, we went through trace bottles of champagne. All right, I was very proud, and I posted a photo on Twitter. All I gotta say is, all I gotta say is, we gotta continue up our game. The next time we go out to brunch, it's cuatro 
bottles of champagne. Uh, and then also, also went bowling. Um, and clearly based on uh, how the games went in bowling, uh, it, w- it, it, it was proven that I have not bowled in a very, very long time. <laughs> very long time. But it was a lot of fun. I really had a lot of fun going bowling. Um, does anybody else go bowling out there? I used to do it when I was younger as a teenager, but I haven't gone in years and years and years. I'd be curious, to actually, if anybody goes bowling. It was a lot of fun. Like I would love to go bowling again. Um, it was definitely an experience. I hadn't even looked into any bowling alleys since I've been down here when I moved here years ago. So definitely a great time. Definitely a great time all around the past couple weeks. So let's get real quick into the chart of the week. <sighs> chart of the week. Bitcoin. If Bitcoin, whether you like it or not, um, whether you appreciate it or not, you have to respect it. Bitcoin is going to be the driver of value because it always has historically been the driver of value. Until something changes within the market, um, we need Bitcoin to be bullish. For the entire space to go up, we need Bitcoin to be bullish. All eyes on Bitcoin. As Bitcoin goes, the rest of the market goes. And so let's give it up for Bitcoin because I've discussed all the time frames in the bullish price action taking place on Bitcoin. Okay, um, What we want to see within the price action, I guess the last thing I'd say, because I've you know spent quite a bit of time talking about Bitcoin on the podcast, the last TA video, and also on Twitter. The one thing I guess I'd hit on super quick is the next key area that I'm looking for Bitcoin to get above, once it reacts to this space, I want to see candle body closes above this area, which would be massively bullish, would be right around $53,000, okay? There's a zone of resistance right in the $53,000 area. I want to see it clear. Oh, I don't have it on this chart here. I must have deleted it by accident. But I know it's 50. Oh, here it is. Yeah, $53,000. So right around $53,000. Once we start getting candle body closes above $53,000 area, um, I I believe that a test and break of $65,000 will come relatively quick, okay? I could see us breaking $65,000 and getting up in the 70,000 plus range as early as September, which would also lead me to conclude it's very likely or very probable in my opinion that we'll see $100,000 by October. Um, and again, I'm calling a cycle top within the fourth quarter of this year. Bitcoin to top, alts to follow shortly thereafter. Um, you know, and if I had to pick a sweet spot at this point, I believe I've commented like, you know, right in the middle of the fourth quarter, like mid-November, late November, somewhere in there. Um, let's get into some Twitter questions. So thank you as always for the interaction on Twitter. All right, so this week I did a, something a little different. I actually asked for non-crypto questions. I just wanted to mix it up. I mean... Obviously, you guys know I love talking about crypto, but I just wanted to mix it up and see what non-crypto questions you guys had. Again, the only things I'm not going to discuss on here are politics and religion, so it could be anything else. But these are the questions I got. So it looks like there's only three questions. Okay, so question one. If you were wealthy enough to not need to work, how would you fill your time? Well, that is a very good question. Um, If I was wealthy and not to have not so if i was here's how i would restate it if i was wealthy enough to never rely on a paycheck from an employer again how i would spend my time is doing something i'm passionate about so i think the way i would spend my time is first off i spent a lot of time a lot of effort more than i could possibly express to you in this podcast that you'd ever appreciate it you can't appreciate uh big ticket item things that people have been through unless you're the person living through it. I spent so much time and energy getting my credentials as a fellow of the Society of Actuaries. So in some capacity, you know, maybe contracting work, um, I still see myself wanting to remain active as an FSA, an actuary, doing some contra- contractual work, consulting work. But I would also add to that um, a big portion of my time, a, a much, 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 much greater percentage of my time 
would be spent in the cryptocurrency space, um, doing more content, maybe a, a newsletter, um, many more YouTube videos, much more active on Twitter, uh, more time determining how I wanted to structure my content, my videos, my, my tweets, um, a little bit more structure and thought process, but put behind um, the materials that I put out. But it would be a lot more time spent in crypto. Great question, by the way. All right, here's a question. If you retired this week, how would you spend your days? I would view that as a very similar question to the last one just asked. The only way I'd tweak your question is there's no way I would retire this early. Uh, the only thing that could ever happen this early in my life would be to become financially independent, which is really what the first question alluded to, right? Not having a need to work for a paycheck. I would, view, I would state, restate what you said as being financially independent, never needing to rely on someone else for a paycheck, right? And that really would change your perspective on how you would spend your time. So I think I just answered. It's a good question. That's, that's what I just answered in the previous question. And the last question is, I'm sure people want to know how to get basics in TA. So really good. This is a really good question, Steve. Um, so you can DM me for more information. I can kind of chat with you privately. But for me, what I did was I just searched for professional trading classes. Again, I took professional trading classes and spent a lot of time paper trading and then um, doing actual trading, but spent a lot of time educating myself on the materials through that trading class. So I sought something out, paid, you know, what I considered at the time a decent amount of money to purchase that content and that person teaching the information. By the way, that's also an, uh, an idea I had was to put out some TA material that you could purchase to learn how to do TA because I do feel um, that I have strong skills in teaching. It's something I actually consider doing outside of actuarial science. I did consider going to school to become, get my PhD and teach as a professor at a university in mathematics classes. I've always tutored all my life. I feel I'm very good at teaching. So I've considered putting my own TA classes together for purchase. That being said, there are other people out there who you can search. I would recommend paying for classes and getting professional classes at whatever speed level you can to, to patiently go through it. The timeline that we're coming up on, that we're going to be entering a bear market, which we can talk about more later uh, next year. I think next year would be a perfect opportunity for you to begin uh, those TA classes. There is a vendor that I can recommend to you uh, who I felt did a very good job. I don't know what the material looks like now, but I know at the time I took it back in 2016, you know, five years ago, um, I viewed it as being very good material. Um, so yeah, go ahead and send me a, a DM. Uh, we can chat more about it, but good question. So I don't think I had anything else. Um, I just hope everybody's enjoying their day. Everyone's a little bit more, um, feel a little better about the way the market is because we have reason to firmly believe that a massive turnaround is in sight and we're entering the final leg of this massive, massive motherfucking generational wealth transfer opportunity and four year bull cycle. So in closing, Please join me in a moment of silence for all of the, those I attempted on multiple occasions to get into crypto and have remained ignorant. Gracias, amigos y amigas.